Hey folks, it's Rob Frannick, David Soto, and Monica Brown from the Princeton Review and CollegeWise. I want to thank you for joining us uh, tonight for our second night of broadcasting uh, in this month of Google Plus events on Google Hangouts on, on Air at Ask Admissions. Uh, we are trying to cover a great many topics around the admissions um, around the admissions queue in breath, anything to do with testing, college admissions itself, how do we actually research, find a best fit school, and then financial aid. So we'll be broadcasting throughout the month. Lots of other very superlative players will be uh, on the Ask Admissions uh, queue at, at uh, Google Plus and Hangouts on air throughout the rest of the month, both from the admission side of the fence, uh, as well as folks like the Princeton Review and, uh, and CollegeWise. Again, Rob Frannick, I'm a publisher for Princeton Review Books. I've been co-author of several books along with David and some of our great team uh, here at the Princeton Review in New York City. Uh, one book is called The Best 378 Colleges. Another is called uh, Best Value Colleges. I'll let David and Monica introduce themselves and then we will queue up our discussion tonight specifically around college college rankings. I should assure you that if you're not familiar with the Google Plus uh, Hangout on, on air as well, you can volley over questions throughout throughout the evening uh, that you want to talk about specifically in regards to rankings, how we do them, how other folks might do them, some myth that might be out there around rankings. We'll try to answer those questions that we receive through our own social media accounts at the Princeton Review and CollegeWise throughout the evening. But be shameless about reaching out to us uh, using the Q&A tool on, uh, on Google+. So David, and then Monica. Go ahead. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. Uh, I'm David Soto. I am a director of data at uh, the Princeton Review. I'm responsible for all rankings and ratings, along with Rob and our team at the Princeton Review, uh, co-author of Best 378 Colleges. Uh, happy to be here tonight. Excellent. Excellent. Hi, Monica. everyone. My name is Monica Brown. I'm director of college counseling at the CollegeWise office in Texas. Plano to be exact, which is just outside of Dallas. Um, before that, I worked in, as an admissions officer for seven years, at Wellesley College for three years, and then at Harvard for four years. So doing, helping students now with the college application process, where before I was sort of on the other side of the desk reading applications of students who applied to college. Excellent. Monica, thanks for taking the time to join us uh, today. And I, I think that folks, again, uh, um, both on the Princeton Review publishing side of the fence as well as on the college-wise college counseling side of the fence, which Monica will be representing tonight, as well as her, her great admissions experience uh, as well, we want to tee up the conversation specifically around college rankings. Uh, one, we wanted to start off the discussion by saying there are a lot of college rankings out there. You probably know this already. Um, and and we think at the Princeton Review and CollegeWise that some of those discussions might be confusing for the average college-bound student, their family and families, and even guidance counselors and college counselors that are helping them along the way. So we want to make sure that we're discussing tonight um, in breath what sort of rankings are out there. Uh, we wanted to use sort of as a, as a test group how Princeton Review is doing their rankings. We think that some of our ranks are a little different from other players, uh, but we do want to dig into, into how we are doing some of those rankings based on student surveys and other quantitative and qualitative metrics, which we'll uh, uh, dig into as well. One of the places that we are I think, most noted at the Princeton Review and one of the products that CollegeWise and Monica and her team use um, throughout the academic year and throughout the counseling year is a book called The Best 378 Colleges, uh, which is a book that we produce with Random House and the Princeton Review. We serve out all this stuff, uh, all of the ranking lists and the, and the rankings that are in that book uh, on PrincetonReview.com, which, which is our website. I bring this book up because we think it is so different from so many other hierarchical ranking list, whether that be U.S. News uh, or Forbes or College Prowler or Unigo, in that, in that all of the rankings in the book are based on the opinion of whom we would consider college experts. We surveyed 126,000 current college students for their experiences academically, outside the classroom, financial aid, career services, are the beds comfortable, are the food good, anything to have to do with your quality of life while you're an undergraduate, taking that cohort of 126,000 surveys and then serving them up in narrative profiles that we write about each of the schools. Uh, as well as ranking lists, 62 dot, top 20 ranking lists, and then some of the ratings that we have in that, that book. So we're proud of this book, but we do want to start off some of the conversation by uh, sort of walking through how, Monica, you might be using some of the rankings uh, that are student survey based in your own counseling with students, how you may have used them in your admissions career in the past, and David, how we, uh, how we create them at the Prince Review, how we're actually getting those surveys up. And then I expect that that will probably queue up some of the questions in our, in our, in our Q&A. Fair enough? Sounds good. All right. 
So Monica, have you used the Princeton Review rankings in the past from Best 378 that are based specifically on the student student opinion surveys? If so, how have you done it? Yes, we definitely use the book as you mentioned at CollegeWise. It really is a book that our students love. Counselors will say that you know they'll take it home, they'll come back, and it's full of post-it notes where they've marked off schools that sounded interesting to them, which maybe they had never heard of before, never thought about before. But you know, after reading the student descriptions, they feel like, hey, this might be a place that I'd be interested in. So I feel like it really does help to open their minds to different types of schools that are out there. So getting past those rankings, it's sort of like the US News that you mentioned that really just focus on more prestige. These are different and our students, I feel, respond well to that. They like hearing from other students. It feels more genuine to them. So that's something that we definitely see students really taking home and getting excited about and coming back and having good conversations with us about why a college might or might not be a good fit for them rather than just saying, well, you know, it's not prestigious, it's not on that U.S. news list, or it's not on this list. It really, I feel, expands their minds. Well done. Thank you. That's great. Good to hear. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And one of the things we, we keep hearing at the Princeton Review is that uh, this book is so great because uh, a lot of the times when you're visiting colleges, you don't have a chance to visit every single one of the campuses that you're considering. So this offers a nice view uh, into everything that Rob talked about, financial aid, academics, campus culture. So anything a student is thinking about, well, Choosing colleges, this really, this book really, really covers it. We have uh, 62 unique ranking lists, uh, eight unique rating lists. Ratings are all based on institutional data that schools are giving us. Uh, the rankings all based on the 126,000 surveys that uh, that Rob mentioned. So, uh, just the breadth of data that we have in this book uh, is really. Uh, uh, second, second to none, in my opinion. Uh, but when you think about uh, what something like U.S. you know U.S. News does, I mean they they have a hierarchical list of uh, of the best colleges out there, and our list uh, you know gives students an opportunity to look at a college from a different you know lots of different lenses, uh, including social life, financial aid, and academics. Uh, so I think you know we've got a good a good product at hand that uh, gives students all those all that perspective. Good, cool. Um, I, I know we see our first question here, and we've collected questions throughout the day uh, through the Prince Review's Twitter account and our other social media platform as well. So we have our first question. Uh, what is the overall best school? Excellent question. Yeah. <laughs> David, yeah. you want to take that one? <laughs> yeah, I, I will take that. So uh, like I was saying before, there is no number one overall academic, uh, academic school. Uh, there's no number one uh, school for you know, uh, it, we don't rank schools hierarchically. So uh, we believe that there's a right fit for every student. And I think uh, Rob uh, and our team constantly talk about fit. So it's about finding the school uh, that is the right fit for you. And these 62 unique ranking lists kind of help identify identify if you want to go to a school that's LGBT friendly, if you want to go to a school that has great food, great quality of life. Uh, you know, so it really allows you to dive a little bit deeper than just say this is the number one school and this is the number two school because uh, we don't really believe in the number one and number two school. We, we believe that there's uh, a school out there for every student. Totally hear you. Totally hear you. Monica, how would you respond to that question if you had a kid in your office, which I'm sure you do, students or families, families, is there a best school overall? I know I saw you at the NACAC conference, National Association College Admissions Counselors last week or two weeks ago in Toronto, and I know we both got this question from lots of even counselors uh, working with students and families. Yeah, I do get students who get caught up in, in prestige and just feeling like, well, I have to go to one of these schools or else, you know, I won't be successful in life. And so, yeah, I've, ha I've worked with students who will say, well, I know you worked at Harvard. I'm really interested in Harvard. And, you know, this is what I'm set on. And if I don't go there, and, you know, they're very stressed out about the college application process. And, I mean, what we try to do, of course, is to make it less stressful by showing them that there are plenty of other schools out there. There are plenty of great schools out there. As David was saying, you know, we also tell students there is no top school out there. It really is going to depend on the student, what you're looking for, um, where, you know, where would be the best match for you? So we spend a lot of time having conversations with students about, you know, what are you interested in and where might you like to live and, you know, what sorts of people do you like to hang out with to try to get at what would be the right college for you, not, you know, what is the number one college that, you know, the rankings tell us what is the number one college. That's, that's not what we, we don't buy into that kind of thing at college-wise. 
Totally hear you. We're, we are nodding in agreement on our side of the fence. Hopefully some folks uh, who might be watching this uh, broadcast are doing the, doing the same. You know, David, I think hit on an interesting point, as you did too, Monica. The idea of the hierarchical ranking list. If you're a 16-year-old kid, and whether your parents went to college or they didn't go to college, everybody is either learning or relearning the college process uh, together, again. But for a 15 or 16 year old to sit with a list of one to a thousand and one schools that are best regional in the Midwest, I, I don't think, and, and Prince Reviews of You has been this way for a long time, that that is going to be a great help to the average student and family. Just to think about, uh, uh, you know, well, uh, if you're, you know, smack dab in the middle, 515 on the on the most competitive schools in uh, in the regional edition of a particular magazine or publication. So. We want to make sure that we're producing things that are actually scalable and, and completely useful to students and families. And I think you, you've, you've hit on this as well. We have ranking lists. Most of them are simply 1 to 20, so it's a palatable list. They should be on either side of the spectrum. And as I was saying in, in sort of our um, hangout last last night and in, in, in talking about how sometimes Princeton Review is not always the most popular person in college admissions because we ask a lot of questions uh, of whom we would consider college experts. We all, three of us, know a lot about schools, but frankly it doesn't matter a whit about what we think. Um, it should matter about what you know, thousands or tens of thousands of current college students are talking about about their experiences academically and outside the classroom. So we brought this up last night. Prince Review has been asking, you know, current college students, are your professors good teachers? You know, do they uh, uh, encourage class discussion? Are they accessible outside the classroom after class ends? Do you, do you never see them ever, uh, ever again? Uh, you know, do they bring the material that they teach in class to life? Do they suck all the life out of the material that they teach in class? I mean, this is stuff that we as consumers uh, want to know, right? You want to find out if a school is going to be a compelling fit for you academically or otherwise. And, and I think that there are few outfits out there, and I think Prince Review is one of them. We'll pat ourselves on the back. And that we're an ability, we have the ability to ask lots and lots of questions of, of hundreds of thousands of students and bring that information back out there to three groups, college-bound students, their families, and guidance counselors. Uh, you know, the three of us are not in the business of writing college view books. I'd be no good at it. I know we probably wouldn't be. But we are in the business of making sure that we're helping students in an accessible and tangible way find a school that's going to be the best fit for them through those levers that we were talking about. So love it. Hats off to you for asking the question. Good question. Uh, let's see, what's our next one here? How do you know if people who fill out your survey actually attend the school? That's a good question, too. Right? That's a great Ruth, question. Ahead, yeah. yeah, you know this one. So uh, 126,000 students uh, filled out our survey last year for our current edition of the best 378 colleges. Uh, and it's a great question, one that we get asked all the time. Yeah. So our survey is available online year-round, uh, and we do know that these students are actually enrolled at a given college because they provide us with their .edu address. They are prompted then to validate that survey, uh, and then we use a third-party partner to validate those surveys uh, at an additional layer of verification. So uh, these students are, of course, from from the, from these uh, from these colleges that they, they say they are, uh, and it is a, a pretty rigorous process that we put into put into place. Excellent, excellent. And you could fill it out how many times a year? Uh, you could fill it out once once a year. Once per academic year. Yeah, once per academic year. All right, good, 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 good. I love it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, right, the, right. The truth is, and this is this is uh, you know the heart of the question. We don't want you know ten kids filling out you know experiences for ten schools that they might not be attending or, or you know anyway. But we. I, I, I think the success that we've had around our student service for a long time is that we've been doing this stuff for you know for a, a significant amount of uh, of time. So I think lots of students have been using either you know this service, Prince Review rankings or ratings or books in the past, and they have become verbose about about giving us once they're you know once they're undergraduates giving us this you know sort of fodder that we need about their experiences academically, first year through senior year, and coming back you know once a year to fill in their uh, fill in their service. So it's been a great. Um, sort of circuit to complete for us and uh, we're grateful for the information and, and we're still certainly receiving a lot, lot of it. So that's an excellent, uh, excellent question. Um, you know, one of the things that came up, and Monica, I'm interested to hear your um, answer to this one as well. Part of our discussion last night, we were talking about how do we, you know, as students and families, actually talk about, in a sensible way, finding fit. And I think rankings are, are part of that, if we can think about rankings in cross-section. Uh, but one of the things that um, we've been talking about is finding fit around the financial aid queue. Uh, and, and we were setting up the discussion by saying, you know, no matter where you fall in the socioeconomic spectrum, 
People are scared to talk about money. You know, we had we had a couple of uh, we had one student here last night and her counselor, and uh, you know, the counselor was saying, you know, when she was looking at school, you know, she didn't know how much money her parents made. Uh, you know, when we start to think about those very specifics that are going to be essential for the FAFSA form and other financial aid applications, we have to be able to responsibly tell people about that. Monica, how do you talk about the financial aid process for students that are coming into your queue or students that you've met with in the, in the past? I know that you had some uh, um, experiences while you were on the admission side of the fence in promoting and creating some glorious financial aid process, so uh, I'm interested to hear it. Yeah, so while I worked at Harvard, I was an admissions officer and a financial aid officer as well. Um, you know, Harvard had a great or has a great financial aid program. It's very generous, but we found that not a lot of students knew about it. They'd look at the sticker price, and it's you know over fifty-five thousand dollars a year, and just think there's no way I could afford that, and maybe not apply because they they thought that they wouldn't be able to pay for it. Um, so my job, well, one of the jobs that I had at Harvard was really spreading the word about financial aid at Harvard and telling students that the sticker price is probably not what you're going to end up paying. So you know. You'll get some financial aid. It's based on need and going through all of that. You have to fill out the FAFSA and the CSS profile. Um, and, you know, we'll look through your parents' taxes and their income and their savings and all of that. And then we'll decide how much we feel would be, you know, affordable for your family to pay. So it, it may not be $55,000. It may be, you know, it was zero for families that made $65,000 or less. So it, I think a lot of students just aren't aware of those types of financial aid programs and so what we would do is just encourage students to not be afraid to call the financial aid office to ask these questions to ask you know people who work at the college um, you know ask them about their policies ask that ask for fee waivers if you're applying to these schools and you think seventy five dollars or eighty five dollars that's so expensive right. so I think it was really more about just telling students you know empowering them to say it's okay to call the office and a lot of times students would feel intimidated about doing that but it's okay to call and ask you know what just tell me more but another way to do it is colleges now have these net price calculators on their website on their websites so you can click on this calculator and it kind of gives you an estimate of what your family might have to pay rather than what the college's sticker price is so you'll enter in a few you'll answer a few questions about you know the number of people in your household, how many students might be in college, how much money do your parents make. You know, some are some are simpler, shorter than others, but you'll go through this and it'll give you an estimate. And so that gives you a better idea. So it, what we would tell students is don't count a school out if you're really thinking, you know, there's no way I can afford it in the beginning. Just kind of go through, do your research. And, um, you know, it, it might be that the school offers you a great need-based financial aid programs, or it could be a merit-based scholarship as well. So Harvard was all need-based, but there are definitely merit scholarships out there as well that students aren't aware of. So just asking those questions, doing the research, I think it would be, you know, a good way to start. Monica, can you just define, as you were saying, around the merit-based aid and, yeah. and, you know, sort of aid that's given out just based on, on uh, family need? Yes, yeah, so the need-based money that I was talking about, um, the, so we were a need-based program at Harvard, and that, as I mentioned, it was really just based on family income and assets. Um, so that was just, we felt after looking through all of that, that you needed this money and we were going to give you this scholarship based on your family's need. Um, you know, it, the net price calculator, as I mentioned, would be a good way to, a good place to go. For example, we had families that made maybe $250,000 a year and up who wouldn't qualify for financial aid, but in some cases they might. So, you know, it, it's very subjective as well. I mean, it can be depending on medical expenses and things like that, but not to get into too much detail about that. But so merit scholarships really will be based on, you know, academics, maybe. You, you got really good grades, or maybe it's a music scholarship, or maybe it's a dance scholarship, an athletic scholarship. So there are some schools that will give you scholarships based on those things. So it doesn't have to do with how much money your parents make. It's more about your athletic ability or your musical ability. And schools differ. So again, every school is different. It's important to do your research and to figure out, well, is, is this school offering need-based financial aid? Does this school offer merit scholarships? or not and those are sort of those are some questions that you should be asking while you're going through the college application process too. 
Totally hear you. Well, well, well yeah. done. I know that David. I, I, I just, I just sort of um, piggyback off of Monica's point. I know that you do a, such a great deal of data collection when it comes to the metrics that Monica is talking about. Maybe walk us through. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. I, we just had a question that came in uh, related to this this topic. Uh, uh, what are the best schools for financial aid, and how much do they uh, how much do they give out? Uh, so we do a book at the Princeton Review and a project, an online project called the Best Value Colleges. So we look at 30 different metrics, uh, all based on institutional data given us to, given us to by schools. And like Monica was mentioning, a lot of students are going to cross off uh, prominent schools off their list, like Harvard, like Yale, like Swarthmore, that are perennial leaders in the Best Value uh, College list. Uh, so we're looking at that data, and we're looking at uh, what the average student is going to pay. So. Uh, for example, Swarthmore is our number one best value college school this year. They have a sticker price of a little over 55000 So a lot of students might balk at that price initially. But when you look at the average grant that they're giving out, it's about $39,000, bringing that price down to about what you would pay for an in-state uh, in state tuition at a, at a state school. Um, so our best value colleges profiles 150 of those schools, 75 public, 75 private, that do an exceptional job of doling out that financial aid. Uh, and like Monica, that that point that you made is is great. You really shouldn't uh, shouldn't cross these these schools off your list because uh, there is a lot of need based aid out there for for students. So we encourage students to to fill out the FAFSA and, and really do do your homework before uh, before applying to these schools. Love it. I, yeah, I think your points are both well taken, and and I think Monica, as you were saying, yeah. It, it, you know, directing students and families to make sure that they're doing their homework around the financial aid process and certainly the college research process. I, I, I am one of the things that I most enjoy about my job at Princeton Review, and I think we're probably all not in agreement on our sides as well, uh, is that we're doing a lot of that homework for students and families. I mean, I, when I was in school, when I was looking at school, I don't think I could have anticipated all of the questions that we can, as knocking around the higher education space for a long time, can anticipate. You, Monica, on the college admission side of the fence and now on the college counseling side of the fence, we know so many of those typical questions to ask that students and families that are going through the college process as, as newbies probably don't know to ask. And, and part of those things are around financial aid. And, and I think, uh, again, such an important question. So glad we brought it up because diffusing the frenzy around around financial aid, particularly, is one just becoming savvy about the college process, and that means the financial aid process as well. So, who you know, bring up that question, pat yourselves on the back because you're doing the right thing, uh, and, and just arming yourself with that information. Uh, so, well, well done, well done. I know we're looking for other. I see some other questions coming up, uh, uh, coming up there, and and uh, so we've covered some some financial aid stuff. Um, I did want to talk a, a, a little bit about some new majors, and one of the things that I know we saw up at the NACAC conference, uh, Monica and myself and David do a lot of speaking gigs on the on the road. One of the questions that I know we all get asked is, what is the best major, or what is the best school for a major in psychology, or or you know for engineering? And uh, uh, Monica, I am interested for your guidance on this question. I'm sure, I'm sure we have this, you know similar guidance on our side of the fence. But what do you tell a kid when when the first thing that they ask is, what's the best school for X major? Yeah, it's again, it's really hard to say. It's and I'm going to keep saying this, but yeah, you really have to do your homework, and you really have to take a look at each school individually. And, you know, students change their minds, too, about majors, so we de definitely tell students, yeah, it's great if you're thinking about psychology to keep that in mind when you're choosing schools, but also know that, you know, most students end up changing their minds, so just be sure to pick a school that, you know, maybe you're not specifically choosing it for psychology, but you also have other reasons right. that you really feel like it's a good match for you or it's a good fit. So that's a tough one. I think it really, I mean, I would tell students, you really just have to think about the schools that you're interested in. You know, if they have psychology, great, and it sounds like it's a great program, well, that's good, but you shouldn't either, you shouldn't choose a college either just based on the psychology department thinking that, or keeping in mind that you might change your mind later, and that there's yeah. more to schools than that too. Totally hear you. Yeah. Uh, we just had a, a, another question yeah. that, that popped up here. Uh, which school has the highest rate of employment among recent graduates? Uh, it's a good question and a pretty difficult one to ask. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, murky data out there around uh, rates rates of employment for uh, for schools. So. 
Uh, schools are reluctant to report that information and there's not really a lot of good data out there. Uh, what we can offer at the Princeton Review, we do have a career services rating uh, and that, that we ask students uh, how you would rate your career placement office on campus. So we do a top 20 list uh, based on career services uh, and we think that schools are doing an excellent job. Uh, number one on the list this year is Penn State, I yep. think. Yep. Uh, they're really integrated into the campus so whereas Rob was talking about it last night where his career services when he went to school might, might have been in the dungeon of uh, yeah, right, the right. buildings. <laughs> it is now really integrated into the uh, into the academic space, into the admissions office. So, uh, so you should really look at a school or consider consider a school, uh, not only on the top twenty list, but that pays. You know, those, these are great questions to ask when you when you visit campus. Do you have a career services office? What do they do? What do they offer? Are there inter internships, externships? Are these the type of opportunities I'm going to have if I'm going to visit your visit your campus and yeah. really attend your school? I love I love of the answer here, David, uh, that, you, that you're giving. Um, one of the things that you should be, uh, you know, vigilant ab about is is not being bashful to ask those questions around career services. Specifically, where or where are your students from? You know, A, B, or C university that you're visiting for your, uh, you know, your first college fair. You're going out to your first campus, uh, you know, campus visit day for an open house. Where are your students going? While they're in school for internships, externships, experiential learning opportunities, anything that you're doing outside the classroom that's likely complementing your study in the classroom, and where are you going after you graduate? Are they going on to graduate school, professional school, or are they getting first-time careers that they can be proud of that are going to be sustainable? And, and Penn State, University of Florida, UCLA, University of Dayton, all of these schools Awesome schools academically by, by the, academically, by the way, but are doing a superlative job in making their career services centers accessible to students early on. So you guys that are, are, that are thinking about college right now, you, you should be on your first open house or your first exchange with that school if you're not seeing the career services center. If you're not talking to counselors from that area or your admissions counselors aren't talking about career services, you should be vigilant about asking those questions and trying to interface with that office directly. Uh, because the thing is, I mean, we, we know it, as we were talking about last night and as this financial aid question had come up before, college isn't getting any cheaper. You're there for four years, hopefully, and you want to make sure that you're exiting not only with a degree, but a degree that's going to, to pr promote uh, um, value to you from a, from a, a job perspective, that you're going to actually get a job that you actually want and be not underemployed but fully employed in something that you really want to do as a first-time career. Good question. Absolutely. Good question. Can you explain the next questions? Can you explain the differences? Oh my word! There it is again. Okay. Can you explain the, the difference between <laughs> rankings and ratings? This is a good question too. That's yeah. a good question. Um, when we start to think about it, as we were saying before in our sort of our opening remarks, we have in in the best 178 colleges and best value colleges, we do lots of ranking lists around uh, new majors that are coming up in areas that students might be interested in but that a lot of guidance counselors might not know, not because they're not well-intentioned, but they might not know about all of the new majors that are happening on the undergraduate community. We have lots of different ranking lists. Um, for our book, The Best 378 Colleges, we try to keep those ranking lists to a scalable level, as you were saying before. We have 62 different top 20 ranking lists, all of which are ranked 1 to 20. Those schools are ranked 1 to 20. Um, so they are on ranking lists specifically. David had referenced, we also do different ratings. In that book alone, we do uh, pardon me, eight different ratings from 60 to 99, 99 being the highest, uh, around financial aid, around admissions, around um, selectivity overall from the admissions office, quality of life, fire, safety, are your professors interesting, are they uh, engaging in the classroom? So, so those are the things that we create rankings around, pardon me, ratings around the difference between rankings and ratings is that not every school is ranked. They don't always make it into that top, top 20 schools that we were talking about before at the Prince Review, but every school that we're writing about in any of these books will have a rating score. So you can, you can use those things throughout. You can expect to find each of those ratings on that 60 to 99 scale uh, and any place throughout our publications and certainly on our on our website as well. That's actually one of the tools that David works on, uh, uh, you know, for our college search on PrincetonReview.com, which is powered by some of those ratings. Sure, yeah, and, and our rankings, just to, just to be clear, are based entirely on uh, whom we consider to be college experts. Those are currently enrolled students. Uh, mm -hmm. The ratings are all based on uh, data reported by schools. Uh, so there's a clear distinction between those two, and everyone, of course, gets a rating. Well, and everyone uh, is on a ranking list, like Rob. Uh, you got like Rob it. mentioned. Yeah, yeah, good one, good one. Yeah, that's an excellent one. Um, 
when uh, you know, I just wanted to maybe walk through some of the uh, rankings and ratings that we that have been doing around those new majors that we were talking about before, David. One of the ones that just came out, uh, I guess, about a week or a week and a half ago, was one of entrepreneurship. Sure. One of those fastest fastest growing undergraduate. Uh, uh, undergraduate majors, maybe you can walk through some of the methodology that we put in working with Entrepreneur Magazine in, in, in creating that ranking itself, yeah. why we did it. Sure, yeah, absolutely. So as Rob mentioned, we were, we partnered with uh, Entrepreneur Magazine on a top 25 ranking list, uh, both on the undergrad and the grad side of, grad side of things. On the undergrad side, uh, the number one school this year was... Um, Excuse me, for Babson That's College, a, yeah, uh, sorry, perennial yeah. favorites, yeah. Uh, outside, <laughs> just outside of Boston. Uh, University of Michigan, number one on, on, the, on the grad side. So uh, we've partnered with Entrepreneur for the past uh, eight or so years. Uh, the way we, we come up with this list uh, is that we, we survey administrators. We ask about their offerings on campus, including internships, externships, and we try and gauge what the entrepreneurial spirit is on campus. Yeah. Because like Rob said, this is a, a fast-growing field. Uh, there's, a de there's a debate on whether entrepreneurs are uh, born or whether they're taught, and we think that uh, we think that now there's a there's a real uh, environment of nurturing uh, current entrepreneurs and, and, and really fostering and incubating their ideas and, and, and really allowing those students to uh, to see them see them to their full extent. So uh, kudos to these top 25 lists. Like it, yeah. uh, it is a growing field. We're seeing more and more schools participating in this. Uh, we're seeing some top schools on this list: Stanford, Harvard, uh, Columbia, and what you all on the list. Um, so we've got a lot of a lot of great schools participating this year. I love it. I love it. Monica, for, uh, from your side of the fence, have you ever talked to students specifically about entrepreneurship uh, programs on the undergrad level? Are you hearing that from students that you're counseling or students that you've been working with over the last couple of years? I've heard that from, I mean, I feel like more and more students are getting interested in that, so I've definitely heard that. Um, you know, I living in Boston, I just moved to Texas, Babson was something that always came up. Oh, students, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, students were looking at that. So, yeah, I think it's something that you hear more students saying, yeah, I'd like to start my own business. And so they're looking to kind of do that at a, at a younger age, especially, you know, with Internet startups and things like that happening. I think students see that and, and you know, get interested in that kind of thing. So. Yeah, I love it. I love it. You know, one of the things, and just to piggyback off uh, off of the conversation here, uh, and and sort of pulling together some of the financial aid and the and the value of what you're getting from your undergraduate degree, when we start thinking about new majors like entrepreneurship, like game design, that we one of the other ones that we've been working on with with David and his team, um, and thinking about those majors that might not be the the most liberal arts type majors, they're they're not psychology majors because they have a very practical output, right? And and the idea of you know, Monica, as you might be counseling students and, and somebody to come into your office and say, you know, I, Monica, I really want to start my own business. And then you putting structure, you know, uh, counseling around those schools that are doing pretty superlative jobs around um, crossing traditional business and entrepreneurship programs with um, undergraduate majors in the liberal arts. I was out at Lehigh University uh, less than a year ago talking about their entrepreneurship program and one of the most compelling things that I heard was a first year student saying that they wanted to do entrepreneurship but they wanted to marry their entrepreneurial skills with something in the liberal arts specifically in the in the performance space. So they were marrying their entrepreneurial skills with a music major on the performance side of the fence. So thinking about the liberal arts ideal which I think we all like and get, right? But then comparing it, pardon me, and marrying it to an entrepreneurial output that might have a more practical focus on the business side of the fence and actually starting businesses that might be disparate on a piece of paper but actually are so complementary and coming out with a, with a business that could actually be profitable and be pretty interesting to start on the undergraduate level. So I love the idea that five years ago or ten years ago it would have been difficult for us to have this conversation in the undergraduate queue. It would have been slightly easier to do it on the graduate school side of the fence, but even not so much there. But now we can talk about it in breadth on the undergraduate side of the fence, which I love. So, I mean, that's, uh, um, that's a good one. That's a good one. All right. We have another question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have any, any other ranking list for our majors other than entrepreneurship? Uh, we do. We just mentioned, Rob mentioned our game design list, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, which we've been doing for the past couple of years. Uh, traditionally, parents are probably frightened of this list, uh, but uh, <laughs> you really you can study game design uh, and, and be employed uh, afterwards. Uh, we were just, just looking online on the um, 
the average starting salary for an undergrad degree who gets a game design uh, is a, just about sixty thousand dollars, which is pretty reassuring for a parent to yeah. you know that their <laughs> their their child is going to be employed after after graduating. Uh, on, for a graduate degree, that that salary jumps up to about seventy five thousand dollars. So uh, it's certainly a field that's gaining a lot of momentum. We do a top fifteen graduate and undergraduate list uh, published on our website. Uh, so we encourage students and parents who might be interested in game design who might not have had the support of their guidance counselor or their parents before to check out our list right. uh, online because uh, we think it's a, it is a growing field like you mentioned. And the thing that I, I, I like about it along with entrepreneurship is they seem to be promoting a team driven approach to both yep. of these disciplines. So you know where, uh, where an engineering student might be paired with a coding student or, or, or vice versa. So it's, uh, it's really a, an interdisciplinary uh, degree and something that, uh, that can be, be used across campus. So it's, uh, it's kind of a cool thing and uh, students should check out. Totally agree. Yeah, I like that. One of the things, and this kind of came up in our, in our sort of pre-discussion around, around what we wanted to uh, cover tonight, was that idea of majors in sustainability. You know, we, we have a rating at Prince Review called a green rating around sustainability. I think if I ever told my parents I wanted to study sustainability in college, I would have gotten laughed out of the room. But um, simply because of that career services to the, to the spirit of the question that had come over, uh, we had done a survey at the Prince Review the last couple of years called College Hopes and Worries, and we asked a few years back, you know, would students and parents, but specifically students, would they value, understand what a school's commitment to the environment would, would be to actually figure out if that school is going to be a best fit for them? First year we got back, it was like 14,000 responses, 70% of whom said it would not only be valuable, but we would choose a school based on its commitment to the environment. So we said, all right, well, there's something there. And what, what we've uh, done at Prince Review is say, okay, sustainability means three things. It means certainly campus culture, your food service programs on campus, your transportation programs on campus, things like that that you're doing right now. But then, how are you teaching sustainability in a classroom environment? And then, are those students getting green jobs after they graduate? So, so, so folks like us that probably didn't have that experience as an undergraduate, we're going to get checked out. I mean, we are going to be completely underqualified for when we start to think about it. We've been following these things along a lot at, at Prince Review and CollegeWise around NACE, uh, which is the acronym is National Association of Colleges and Employers, and they track where students are actually getting jobs after they, after they graduate. And NACE estimates that in the next 10 years, there's going to be growth in sustainability in jobs around green jobs are around uh, 25 to 30 percent in the next 10 years. And it might not be brand new jobs, but our own jobs and what we're all doing as you know, big, big kids right now will ha likely have a sustainability element. And the folks that are going to be truly prepared for that are students that are in college now and those students that are coming up through the queue uh, in the next couple of years. So just to think about that as, as other than entrepreneurship, other than game design, thinking about that whole idea of sustainability and it's yeah. going to be massive growth, massive growth when we think about it not only from an academic perspective but a career services perspective. So that's good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that green, uh, Rob, you mentioned the so so the uh, the green rating that we do. Uh, it's it's one of the many things that we do that are driven by driven by students. So students give us information, like they tell us in the College Hopes and Worries survey, that they see uh, that they they are they want this type of information. So in in reaction to that, we are able to make a product around something like sustainability and really uh, really drive interest around it. Excellent. So we've seen so many so many schools participate in our uh, green collection, and uh, it's it's really heartening to see how many how many schools are taking. Uh, taking notice and also students are you know graduating or actually employed after. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I mean, it's something we're going to be continuing to write about. Uh, I, I, I definitely, Monica. We're going to follow up with you and your 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 team throughout the year to see if they're if they're uh, you know putting schools because of their commitment to the environment on on their list, and we'll, and we'll totally work together on on those things. Um, one of the things that I, well, one of the other questions, uh, uh, this is an excellent <laughs> question. Uh, how do college administrators react to ranking lists? Do they think the lists are, are, are accurate? So I, I, I know this is a question that continues to come up through the Princeton Review queue. Sure. Um, you know, as we were saying before in our, some of our opening remarks, sometimes Princeton Review is not always the most popular player out, out, out there when it comes to um, college administrators, co college-bound students and their families are the ones that I think are listening to many of the voices that we're hearing. Again, those 126,000 students and many of the other ranking lists that we put out there. Here's the answer to the question. Generally speaking, if college administrators get on good lists for Princeton Review and they will trumpet out many of those things, uh, you know, best professors, best food, best dorms, whatever it might be, academic or otherwise, 
On the other side of the spectrum, if you get into some of our ranking lists, you know, we're the folks that produce uh, our party school list for Princeton Review, many of our other social ranking lists at the Princeton Review. Generally speaking, uh, most of the schools that are on that list uh, will either try to discredit the way that we're going about the process of creating our ranking lists, uh, and and uh, generally are not, are, 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 you know, give some pushback for being on those lists. But the answer is, I mean, whether you're on a, uh, one of the most coveted lists at Princeton Review uh, or a less favorable list at Princeton Review, the methodology is the same. As David was talking about, as Monica knows well, we're just reaching out to students and we're asking them questions. Now we happen to be asking lots and lots of them about their experiences academically and outside the classroom from social life to quality of life to career services and so on, financial aid. Um, so in my mind, and I think in our mind, these lists are so accurate simply because of the massive amount of numbers that we're getting in from current college students about their experiences and then putting that stuff, the, putting that information back out there unfiltered through the Princeton Review queue uh, uh, you know about uh, about what those voices are telling us. Those true college yeah. experts. And, and Rob, yeah. I would say that uh, it, it, despite some of the uh, some of the grievances that colleges yeah. might have, I would say that uh, a lot of our lists have actually prompted some change. And I think uh, oh, yeah. change yeah. on campus. And I think uh, the party school is one of the many lists that we we talked about. But some of our other other lists uh, ha have prompted the administration to take some some pretty drastic measures in reducing alcohol consumption on campus. Uh, they've also instituted some uh, LGBT clubs oh, uh, for, for, yeah. for students yeah. that are on the LGBT unfriendly list. Uh, so I think you know schools can use these as a tool to, to institute change on campus, and it's uh, it's rewarding to see that because we are really giving the unfiltered advice of. of, of Currently enrolled students. I totally hear it, and, I, and that, those are good points to bring up. Monica, how, how either on the administrative side of the fence, or how might might uh, um, <laughs> how might you from the college counseling side of the fence view the accuracy of uh, of some of those lists, whether they're Prince Review lists or other are there other lists out there? Um, yeah, I was thinking about, uh, let's see, when I worked at Wellesley College and we'd look at the Princeton Review rankings and, you know, Wellesley was always on the stone cold sober list. Oh, that's right. That's <laughs> so the opposite would, of our party school. Yeah, right, the opposite. So we would laugh about it, and you know, but that's something that we would make it a point to talk about. I mean, not that this is this is a party school, it's not like that, but we would say, you know, there are definitely ways to, you know, have fun on campus and, and you know, there are parties going on and so, you know, we kind of laughed about it, but then we did use use them to inform the way that we interacted with students where they would ask us, so what is there to do here on the weekend? Because they thought, well, no one does anything kind yeah. of fun on the weekend. So, I mean, not not just drinking, but just in general, they think it's just dead around here. So, so it was something that we did look at and, and we did make it a point to yeah, reassure students that there were things, fun things happening on campus. So, well done. I gotcha. I gotcha. You know, one of the one of the things, and we should just share it with the audience. And I know we want to be respectful of everybody's time. We wanted to keep you for forty five minutes. We have two more minutes up on the uh, up on the clock. But the way we come about uh, our uh, um, party school is we look at five different factors this year from those hundred twenty six thousand kids. The opposite of those factors drives that stone cold sober list. So the flip side of uh, of the party school list. But we ask students their overall rate of consumption on a weekly basis of hard liquor on campus, beer consumption on campus, alcohol, we have hard, hard liquor, beer, overall drug consumption on campus, hours of study spent outside the classroom, and then popularity, for, popularity of fraternities and sororities on campus. So number one school in the Prince Reviews Party School is this year is University of Iowa. Number one on the Stone Cold Sober list, I think it's 16 or 17 years running, is Brigham Young University. 98% Mormon, probably not too surprising to your viewers, our viewers here. But um, so anyway, that's the way we come up with our party school list uh, uh, overall. But again, all based completely on that student uh, uh, student opinion. One of the other last questions. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. yeah. So uh, last uh, last question here: Will attending a school that appears in the party school list hurt a student's chances of employment after graduation? Uh, it's a, it's, it's a good, good question, question yeah. and I think yeah. we. You know, all of the schools we should say uh, that are in this book are uh, excellent academically. Uh, so, uh, I, well, I don't think that a, that a school being on the party school list will hurt chances. Actually, uh, we saw an independent study done uh, for our top ten party school lists and our top ten sober lists, 
and their mid-career earnings uh, for the party school, ironically, was $10,000 higher than those on the sober oh, I love it, yeah. So we're not advocating anything uh, one way or another, but we are saying that uh, if you're looking at mid-career earnings, uh, that is something something to look at. Well done. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Um, you know, and then from the admission side of the fence, uh, and we track these numbers, and David and his data collection team at Princeton Review do the, do the same thing. You know, we've not only seen uh, numbers uh, for those students that are applying to schools that happen to make it onto our party school or any of our social ranking lists ever go down. Normally, they go up the next the next year. So that's just uh, you know sort of to, to put it out there that that um, you know there there could be some uh, rather positive effect on on a, on, a, on a school's enrollment just from the numbers of students that uh, uh, that apply the next year. So, folks, thank you for being so attentive. Thank you for these excellent questions that we've collected throughout the day at uh, at Princeton Review. We hope that this is uh, helpful. Monica from CollegeWise, thank you so much. We appreciate all of the guidance and looking forward to working together again. Thank you, guys. All right. Thanks, David. Thanks, guys. All right.